Okay, so let's start this, this last lecture. It's a bit. Uh, what about now? Is it fine? Yeah. Okay, so let's start this uh, last lecture. It's uh, also on self supervised uh, learning. Um, the other day we had a lecture on self supervised learning uh, from video frames. And now we are going a bit beyond as we are going to take video not as only as a uh, multimedia document for um, visual features but also for audio features because the, in video there are also audio tracks and that's also an uh, interesting signal that we can exploit to, for different applications. So basically the main motivation is that um, I know that you are in a master in computer vision, vision program but uh, you know there are some people out there who are doing master in computer vision masters in speech or music or audio technologies, right? And all these people, they have, they, we have uh, found like some ring to rule us all or some things to rule us all, like which we like the perceptrons, right? So they are all these people, they are also using uh, neural networks to solve their task. And that's very exciting because they give us a common language that we can, from which we can exchange or learn a lot and develop new exciting tasks. So, um, the basic idea that I want to, I will follow like through all the lecture is that uh, so we have seen that um, with neural networks, one way to understand how what they are doing is that um, these are these uh, models that they learn representations uh, from our data. If you have an image, we you can think that when we are solving image classification, what in the end what we are doing is we are predicting a one hot uh, encoding in which we expect that like like the highest class, it's the one that it's the corresponds to the right label, and it's kind of a representation as well, just that it's a one hot encoding, right? And so we can go from an, from one image to these representations, and we can think of these representations as uh, locations in a high dimensional space. In this case, we would like three dimensionals. If there were if there was a classification problem with only three classes, but we know that we may have many more if we just a uh, higher dimensional space. For example, ImageNet, you can think like that solving ImageNet, it's equivalent to projecting our images into a dimension, multi high dimensional space of 1,000 dimensions because there are 1,000 classes in ImageNet. But it's the same problem, but think, you can think about it from another perspective. So we go from images to representations, okay? And what's interesting is uh, speech and audio people, they are also using uh, neural networks, they can also do the same thing. They can go from uh, the, their signals to some kind of representation. And that gives a common uh, common features, they, that, that can lead us to common feature space from which we can develop uh, interesting applications. More interestingly also, we can, uh, we can also go from one of these representations to, in our case, to pixel space, right? So you, you had a lecture with Michal, I guess, on generative models, or Adriana, Michal, yeah? In which, uh, so given a label, for example, of, a, of an object, that would be, um, that would provide the, uh, an enough data to um, generate images. So based on this perspective, and also the speech people, they, or other people, they also have different things, uh, I'm going to follow this approach, like we have images or videos, actually videos. We have uh, audio signals and we know how, both how to encode it and decode them with neural networks. And if we can do all of this, th there are many opportunities ahead to, for new applications. So in particular, this lecture will focus in, in the case or the, or to, will focus in trying to exploit that in the case of videos, uh, considered as multimedia document, there's both visual and audio information which is synchronized. And it, and it kind of comes synchronized for free, right? So when, whenever you record a video, you are capturing the light, but you're also capturing the sound waves. And they are already synchronized. And um, this synchronization um, might be enough to develop a self-supervised learning task. So as I know that you have followed uh, the problem of machine computer vision, this is probably going to be the first time you, you think about uh, what about audio? How do you deal with audio? So for many of you, that's going to be the first step. But good news is that you probably know everything you need to know 
to deal with audio nowadays in deep learning. So how, how can you, we encode or, or, or decode audio? So to encode it, uh, surprise, uh, you can use recurring neural networks or you can use convolutional neural networks. I'm not fully sure of if you think that that's going to be easy or not. Uh, normally the recurrent ones that's kind of maybe easier for you to understand because probably you have seen recurring neural networks in the framework of language main, mainly as a sequence of words but you can think that audio is more just as a, a sequence of samples but it's a temporal sequence and so recurring neural networks somehow we, we have thought that they are super cool to encode sequences and, and, and they are, but actually can also encode uh, sequences with commercial networks, which maybe it's not that popular, but that's also possible. Um, so if you don't really know how to do it, the, the idea, so have, have you seen that? Did you have any lecture on commercial networks for language or speech? You did? You did. All of you. Somebody else? Well, anyway, just so basic idea is that uh, you get instead of using 2D convolutions, you can think that your filters are only 1D, and probably that's it, <laughs> right? And if you want to have memory of, of what happened in the past, you can always uh, fit as input the previous prediction, and that's a way it, that could be a way similar to how recurring networks they have their hidden state from the past. It's another way. Anyway. Um, so the point, the, what I'm telling you is like the, these tools for convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks are actually also like attention uh, layers, which are common in, in, in vision. Maybe, maybe, maybe attention and recurrent are not that common, but they can be applied to process uh, images and video. They are, can be used uh, to process audio. And to decode, same thing. There are also, you can also like decode, so then construct uh, sequences of, of uh, of audio uh, signals, uh, both with neural networks or with commercial neural networks, both both applies. Um, it is true, though, that in the audio and speech communities, it is quite common that instead of just taking the the raw waveform, that can be done. Okay, um, these communities, they they many of them, they are very convinced that they ha that their handcrafted features, some of them, they are very valuable and they are going to first extract this, some of these handcrafted features and then feed that into a neural network, okay? And they have shown that many applications that that's good enough. So apart from, so while in images we, I mean, Alex, I think that most of architectures we discuss, we feed the pixels directly into the neural networks. We don't do something before. In many uh, audio, works, first they extract things like the MELA spectrum or MFCC coefficients, whatever, but in the end they, they often contain uh, spectral information like in terms of frequencies because they, 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 they know for sure that that's very important and they, they, don't, they don't ask the network to learn that frequencies are important because scientists, they are very convinced that that's important, okay? Um, and, then, and some others, they just use raw audio and expect the network to, to learn whatever is important. Of course, that uh, using extracted, handcrafted features that helps also a network. In if the knowledge you, you extract is useful and is enough, that helps the network because it doesn't need to train to learn so many. Um, so that's a, yeah, that's an idea of uh, speech encoding and decoding. That's a model which is quite popular. It was from UPC called uh, uh, Segan, in which uh, the input is is uh, noisy voice. These are convolutions, and the output is the voice, the speech without noise, okay? And these are all convolutions. So that's, that would be like the encoder, and it would be the decoder. Okay, so I know that it was very brief, but I just wanted to tell you that if you have audio information, um, you are, it's not that hard to fit into your neural network, okay? And there are many works there. You can start from the links I provided. Then, what if, let's assume that you, now you're experts, that whatever audio signal I give you, you, are, you can train your network there, you can define architecture, what can we do then? So let's look at multimodal architectures between vision and audio. So that goes from vision, uh, so vision information to audio. And, and exploit this self-supervised paradigm. So one of these uh, first works 
is that um, so in this world they uh, for each frame they uh, extracted uh, some the frequency frequency information uh, yeah it's called the kilogram that's this kind of uh, audio features that or are representations that it's important for audio people so and you can compute that so there's an algorithm that computes that and the uh, the assumption what they exploit here is that the the sound that uh, so the audio track in a video, uh, so the audio and visual tracks for a video, they are correlated. They were trying to explore this, okay? So what they did, they, they had a huge amount of video, so they had many frames, and they have like some uh, audio snippet around the video frame, and they train a neural network, motion neural network, so that given one frame, the network should predict this kilogram, okay? Whatever this audio representation. So they train that, and what they observe is that uh, if they look, so they look at the kilograms they obtain here at the output at inference time, so at the test time, so they feed new frames, they predicted the kilogram, and then what is they, they clustered the kilograms based on a class with a clustering algorithm. And they observe so now you, that uh, clustering the predicted kilograms, <coughs> when they look at the frames, the image frames, that that uh, that corresponded to the clustered uh, kilograms, the visual frames they they also, they also had like some common semantics. Let's see. So here you have like for each row, it would be like one of the clusters that they created with the predicted kilograms. Now you see like the first cluster, there's C, so probably that's a cluster where the with the, where the predicted audio was kind of related to the sound of waves, probably or whatever audios or sounds you hear at the beach. The second cluster, there were like kids and babies, so probably there was, there were, in the audio tracks there were uh, yelling babies. Uh, here, it seems to be something like fun, or maybe there's music or whatever, maybe it's a bit more, more strange. Here it seems to be sports or sports, there's a ball here, I'm not really sure what they observe, but. So the, they saw that there was some relation. Also, and you have seen this earlier, uh, they observed that in the in the features that were learned by this by this neural network, some of these convolutional features, again, they were they they had high responses to some specific semantic uh, classes. Even though this was never trained with any label, everything is self-supervised. Okay, but they observed that high activation for some filters they were coherent in from the semantics perspective. So they had like. Some one neuron uh, was giving high activation for babies, and actually, um, you could you can also like localize weekly localize the baby on the on the frame. Everything trained, self-supervised, no manual labor. Another work they did in a similar spirit is they learn features, but in this case they created the data set of uh, of uh, the sound and and pixels of and video recording. Uh, of different objects that were hit with a stick, right? Yeah. So they, this data set was co is called the greatest hits data set. So in the end, so there was a, this Andrew Owens, the first author who was running around MIT campus, like hitting everything he could uh, find and recording that. And then so creating a large data set. And then again, training a neural network, a commercial neural network. Um, in this case, they, they introduced an, an LSTM on top, but in the end, it was predicting the kilogram again, okay? Then in this case, they, instead of doing the clustering, what he did is uh, he looked at the kilogram, extracted features, and then he had another data set, a test data set that it was not used during training. He extracted the, the kilograms, the real ones, and then uh, given one video frame, it predicted a kilogram and went to this uh, data set, so the, he got a large data set, and picked the, um, pick the kilogram, the real kilogram that was most similar to the predicted kilogram. Yeah, and then, so, so when he found the best matching, he took the audio track from that matching kilogram and then he added it into the video. So he was, he was sonorizing the video, okay? And, and, and it was, so there was an LSTM, so there was some temporal coherence, yeah? So now I'll show you some of the results. To help 
understand what our model's doing, we can look at the video clips in our database that it's transferring audio from. These are the audio clips whose sound features are most similar to those predicted by our model. Okay. Yeah. So all the what what you heard was not the the first time or the, all the time. It was not the right. So it was not the real audio track from the video. Yeah. They were all retrieved thanks to the predictive algorithms and doing a retrieval. Okay, another nice work uh, about audio feature learning. It's this one, it's called uh, SoundNet. They, they are all, all from MIT, from Antonio Torraba's lab. And here what they did is, um, so you have your video, you feed your frames through two networks. One of them trained uh, with ImageNet, you know that. Another one trained with Places. That's a data set, large data set also, but for locations, not for objects, okay? These were the ones were trained, labeled. So given a video frame, you had like predictions of uh, locations and objects. Then they look at the audio track, they took the raw waveform, and they define a new architecture, a sound node architecture, convolutional one, but it's for audio, so it's 1D convolutions, not 2D. And they train this network to predict the same <coughs> object or scene classes that were defined, so that defined for ImageNet and places. In order to train it, uh, the, let's say the, the labels, the annotations that were used, or the, so the predictive values, they were the ones uh, predicted by the, by the visual part. So this will be like what's called a teacher network. So this network that was trained in a supervised way with, by somebody annotating the ImageNet uh, data set or the Places data set. It teaches the audio uh, network what it should be doing. Do you follow that? Yeah, so, so I mean somebody annotated images and you, you, tra you train actually two neural networks, but if it's easier for you to think, you can think that it's only one, but you run a neural network and then, when you have a, a new video frame, you feed it on the upper tower that generates, predicts some labels for cat, dog, whatever. You feed here the raw uh, waveform for audio, and then and you train this network so that at the output, if, if, if this one is telling you cats and, I don't know, and the city, this network, so you, you train this network so that the predictions are cats and city. Yeah, so you kind of have labels for free, well in the end you are, you are kind of transferring the labels, that's why I wrote here label transfer, so you are kind of transferring the labels that you are predicting from the visual track to the audio track. Yeah? So what we are learning here are uh, audio features. So here you see like... So this is the prediction uh, only based on audio. So that's, these are predictions from SoundNet, okay? From the lower network. So the lower network does, doesn't see any frame, any video frame, right? And you see like you have, on top you have um, places, predictions, and or maybe the opposite way, but I don't remember. One of them are, these are, yeah, these are uh, objects, and these are the dogs. It's ImageNet, and these are places, right? But the predictions that you see, they are based on audio only, and there was never any annotation of those videos. Yeah, the, all, the only annotations that we exploit here are the ones from ImageNet, but they are not from this data set at all. Oops, wait. Uh, then, so the story, quite quickly, is that the features that they learn, they are very good, even better than many of the uh, audio features that audio scientists had handcrafted for many years. And if you look at the features that they learned, so like the ones from the first layer, for example, you, s you see like, so these are like 1D convolutional filters that are learned by this network. And you see that they have like their shapes. So these, these shapes are self-supervised learn, automatically learn. They kind of make sense, right? They try to, they seem to be 
uh, matching some frequencies, which kind of makes sense. Also, if, if you look at the activation from a convolutional layer, you'll see what kind of similar to what we saw earlier. They saw that some of the neurons, they have high activations uh, with correlations with, in this case, with baby chalk. Some others, they were, have correlations with bubbles. In a similar spirit, this other work, what they do is they, uh, yeah, so they have a, a neural commercial neural network that's a teacher that given us uh, images of faces, it will look at the face expression and predict emotions. Yeah, th so this, this one is straight manually, it's the teacher, right? But by supervising, so by uh, exploiting the self-supervision from video, they uh, feed sound to a voice CNN, so that's the one that you train. And this CNN, uh, you train it to predict emotions from the labels that come from the visual part. It's same approach as before. So in the end here, uh, they have, they train a network for sound that will predict emotions, but they do it by transferring somehow the labels from the visual, visual part. Yeah. So in this case, the only notation was of faces. Somebody at some point annotated many faces for emotions. And by doing this transfer, they managed to have uh, a network that predicts emotion from speech, from voice. Yeah. Okay, what else can we do? Uh, from vision to audio, yeah, okay. So what if instead of learning features, we generate, yeah, we do generate the audio, so that's be one classic problem. So imagine you have a, a video which is silent and you want to, in this case, you predict the audio features. In this case, these features, so this problem is very specific for speech. These features, they are uh, very well known features for speech so that if you predict these features, later you can synthesize speech. Speech people know what exactly what they are, okay? So actually, the, these authors, they have different works. So you see, you see a video now, and, and they, they show like different works about the iterations. So that was like the first work, and then later they improve it with, uh, they combine not only uh, the video, but also optical flow. And well, in the end, they, they predict uh, some features that will allow them to, to synthesize speech yeah. from silent video. <coughs> Ready? So that's the that's the input for the set white with i seven soon. 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 Okay, so of course that's a quite a control environment, but that's something. Interesting, right? Um, okay, from what about the opposite direction? What, if we, what can we learn from audio to vision? Um, from audio to vision, okay. So uh, that's a work we had here at UPC, we'll present next May. Uh, here what we did is uh, we, uh, we train uh, convolutional neural network, yeah, everything is convolution, from uh, to encode speech, and so this speech uh, is going to generate faces, and in our work, these faces, they are from, do you know this guy? Nobody? Yes, who is this guy? A musician, a YouTuber, a musician, what is this? Both, okay, so do you know his name or not? Okay, great, excellent, because that's one of the first things that you can recognize the, the identity, so yeah. So that's a famous YouTuber called Jaime Altozano who kindly allow us to uh, use his data. Uh, we actually, we can generate faces from different YouTubers. Quality is not super good, but okay. Scientifically, I think it's interesting because we go from raw speech, so no frequency spectrum, so that's raw speech, totally. Um, so created a data set from 10 YouTubers and okay, and normally it, it generates, most of the faces they look realistic, sometimes it gets confused with the identity, but also it's a bit noisy, the data set. Um, so we do that with a, with a GAN, Simplified Versal Network, I think probably you've had lectures on that. So that what a GAN is doing is actually generating uh, different faces 
So, so yeah, so you see like here like uh, different faces are generated, right, for the, for the, for the speech coming from this YouTuber. Um, we, these are like the, so from, from the test set, like the average of all the faces. Um, maybe call this a bit better. And here what we do is we, what we do is we, let's see, we, we combine speech from one identity to, to another, right? Let's say like half, half, I don't know, the, so this is to Sonia, I don't know who is she, but if you recognize her, you can tell me. It's okay, another YouTuber. So let's say we, we combine like half, half speech from one and another, and then the, the face reconstruction is also like half, half. It's uh, quite blurry because it's in between. Here, there's more speech portion. So we are, we are combining speech from two speakers. And then the face we generate is also like a mixture of, of them. What else we can do? Um, we can do something that's called joint uh, embeddings, which means that what you, you don't try to go from one modality to another, but you, you, you try to project both modalities into the same representation. Okay, and I'll show you like why would you we want to do this. So that's something we did. Yeah. So what we, we train your network that based from audio, audio from this video that you don't see, right? So we retrieve a video whose representation uh, matches the best the, on the one that we extract from audio. So we have the audio. We fit into a network that gives us a representation. Then we have a large data set of many, many videos, each of them with the representation, and we find that the best match. Okay. So you're, now you're listening to one the audio from what, this video that you shouldn't see, but, and then you're, you're looking at a video whose semantics, they kind of match the ones that we extract from the audio. Yeah. Maybe I should go back to the previous slide to understand what we do. So what we do is we train a neural network, so we have video. So in video, you have like many uh, pairs of sequences of images and audio tracks, right? And we train a neural network so that, when, so we have pairs, so that, that if we fit the audio from one part, the representation we learned here should be the same as when we fit the video coming from this part and it's projected over, over here. If, if we train a neural network that does that, that when we have let's say one video, uh, we take the audio and the representation it projects is exactly the same one as the one we obtain from the, from the, so one from the audio, one from the video. If we, we achieve that, then what we could do is we, we can, let's take an audio from one video, we project it to our network, we have our representation, and then we look for a video, but, but a video representation that, that matches this audio, but uh, from, not from the original video, of course. Yeah. So we can go from audio to video, doing this, doing retrieval, or the opposite, we can, given this video. So given the, the, the feature extracted from this video, cebolla, we are cilantro, retrieving y tomate. Uh, tomate rojo. an audio track. So you are Pero listening to an audio track mis tortillas, tortillas that was received from visual features. And if you notice, probably you un most of you understand that this uh, Spanish-speaking track, while the video, it looks that the speaker is not, uh, so that, the, that this cook is not speaking Spanish from, from her clothes, but still it's about cooking, right? So if you, if you listen, you, you see that it's talking about cooking. So it, the, the network kind of uh, figure La out how to match audios from cooking with videos from cooking. Esto no lleva medida. Good. What else? A uh, bit more impressive results are these ones where they, but it's the same. So it's the same as spread always. It's you, in this case, it's not that they do a joint embedding, but uh, they are uh, learning contrastive loss. So they want, well, yeah, you can think it's a kind of a joint embedding. So they are given input video, they have end frames, the audio, and they want to, to so they, they, they train the vision and audio network so that this is uh, kind of similar. Okay, uh, what I wanted to say here. <coughs> yeah, that they learn, yeah. What, it's, what, the, what is nice of this work is that by doing, by training this vision and audio um, sub network, the features that they learn both from the vision and audio ones, they are very good, let's say, to, to later solve uh, classification problems. Another work 
in this case, it's, it's not that you are trying to, to make sure that the representations from vision or audio, they, they are exactly the same. You, you want to, you train a network that will predict if the matches, they correspond or not. Yeah, so you, you, you show to the network pairs of audio and, and video that, that match, so they come from the same video and they are aligned or that don't. And then if they match, you want the network to, to predict yes. If they don't, they, you want the network to predict no. Yeah. Okay, so you train the network this way. And if you do it, in this case, notice that they are doing the log spectrogram as the input for the audio. If you do it, um, kind of, again, uh, you will, and you train a network, you will see that uh, you will find that some, um, yeah, that the network will have um, kind of the capability of localizing, first of uh, localizing some concepts like horizon, railway, crowd, again, kind of for free, everything. Or the opposite, you, you will see like, okay, and these features, they are also very good for uh, solving some tasks, but features which are learned in a self-supervised manner. And the audio features, they are also like quite rich and they make sense, the audio features that, that are learned, um, they, they make sense for different semantics. And if you use them, uh, here for example, they compare to SoundNet, that's the one we saw earlier, so the, the ones we have in this work, uh, these audio features, they perform better than SoundNet. What is also interesting is they, if again, if we look at the convolutional features uh, in this case, um, you, you can actually have a, a, a weak location of the object that it's sounding. Okay, and that's what they show here. I think there's a video, yeah. So by, by this, just by training with pairs, with pairs that match and pairs that match. And you obtain like this kind of weak object detectors for free. So that's, that's it's telling you that, that this audio, it's kind of matching, it basically matches this. I hope you guys enjoyed the song and thanks for watching, subscribing, bye. And now that, so it matches that this audio corresponds to violins, always in a self-supervised way. There's no manual notation ever. So there are like a few works on, on this direction. Um, here they improve it with an attention model, I think. Yeah, it's telling you like some source localization. I think I will go back. Okay, um, what if we, yeah, what if at, uh, instead of like row, like general audio, we look at speech. So um, this is again work from people from MIT. So they had this first, this first work in 2016 in which what they did is, uh, again, they, they, um, they collect a data set of images and then they, they recorded uh, people describing what's in that image, okay? So they had the speech, the speech of the description of that image, okay? So this is no caption. Okay, th there are many works that what they do is caption, I mean, they lose, losing, using language. So everything I'm presenting here, it's all speech, no caption at all. Okay, it's important because that's what it's really interesting. Okay, so just this image and they ask somebody, okay, just this, describe whatever. And they describe, yeah, um, well, there's, a, there's a kitchen, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, so they had images, they have uh, speech recordings, and then they train a new network with pairs that match and pairs that didn't match. Right, and they, they, they train the network to, to predict if, if there was a matching between the, the speech describing the image and the image. Yeah, that's all the training we're doing. Yeah, I, okay. I know that here there is no video because it's just an just image, but I think it's, it's <coughs> still there, I'll tell you. Then what did they observe? So they observed that, so imagine you have this image and you have uh, here, this would be like the speech so the audio, the speech signal, the spectrogram, and here you have written like what what was the word that was mm, pronounced, like from here to here, like this part it was pronouncing the word fill, yeah. Fine, do you understand the figure? Then what is interesting is like this graph. So this graph it's telling you it's 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 
plotting the similarity score that the network is predicting. Yeah? So what, what we observe that the highest uh, similarity, so the high, high similarity score, uh, is achieved with the word grassy, okay? Which, so the, f f with the phonemes grassy, which, okay, it's kind of pretty good, right? So it's this word, so it seems quite relevant and representative for, for this image, yeah? While other words like, I don't know, okay, maybe rising, it's, it's, it's not, not similarity at all, right? Large, okay, maybe it kind of makes sense. Mm, they kind of, uh, they kind of, sh of show that that the network was kind of had uh, the capability of, of finding correlations between the phonemes and the con visual contents in training in a self-supervised way. Okay, then that was a work from 2016, and then uh, last uh, autumn, like they did this work with uh, some students from UPC, so the Yara and the Daxuris, they they were usually from here actually, and they went one step further, and they did kind of something similar to what we saw earlier. So they, um, apart, instead of having a similarity score, now they, they look at the convolutional activations, the spatial activations, and they observe what part of the image was being attended uh, throughout the speech, throughout the spoken words. So what you will see now, so again, you are, you are comparing an image with audio, and I know that this is not video, but I guess probably the next work the, the race will be about video. So um, you have the image. Over here you will have the speech. And they, they plotted like the activations on different parts. Yeah? So now I'll show you the video. And I must tell you that the video, so, so I think that the visualization is not super well synchronized with uh, the audio you will listen. I think, but that's, the problem is in the recording of the talk. Okay, because you'll see that it, it tells, when you listen grass, you will see that the, the grass, or I don't know, whatever, or lighthouse, the lighthouse is not on. But, I th but that's because there's a delay in the recording of, of the talk. Yeah? If you go to the website, you can see like, something better synchronized. But it, it gives you the idea. So first, um, they, this is kind of the results you see in the, in the paper. You will see that in these images, uh, when, when, the, when they feed the spoken word woman, they had like high activations in these areas, okay? Which kind of correspond to the location of, of woman. Now let's watch the video. So at the start of training, our networks don't know very much. And so you wouldn't expect the match maps to really give you any sort of valuable insight into what's going on. Uh, in fact, they start out quite diffuse because every piece of the audio, you know, kind of just matches every region of the image approximately equally. But as training goes on, uh, what you're going to see is actually we converge to an alignment that seems to be relatively stable. So after you've trained for long enough, you see these bubbles uh, in, in the density start to appear, which seem to say that, you know, this region on the left, you know, that's capturing the girl in the blue dress, seems to really resonate with that first uh, section of the spectrogram down there, whatever that may be. So let's take a closer look at what these match maps are actually telling us. So I'm going to show you a series of videos where we've taken the match map and we've actually then uh, used it to modulate the alpha channel over the image, and we're going to play it through time so that it's synchronized with the audio. So basically, you're going to see the image light up uh, at a point in time wherever the network thinks it's being described. This is a photo of a girl standing in front of a lighthouse. The little girl is wearing a blueprint dress. She has blonde hair and blue eyes. The lighthouse in the background is white with a red roof. Here in this picture, there's some skiers going up a mountain. Large brick castle is in the distance and is surrounded by bushes. Here we see a stretch of grass and a small road leading up to a very old ancient ruin. A view of a very tall mountain or volcano with snow on the top, with a lush green field with red flowers in it. No, probably that's enough you know, by now. Um, so you see that's kind of in the direction that we were talking about the way, like how humans learn. So we learn, I mean, we learn, we understand language before we learn to write and read, right? So it kind of makes sense that networks should be able to understand a speech without writing or reading. Then finally, like the most ex exotic architecture, uh, what if we have like multiple inputs 
and one single output. So here we have like as input like speech and, and vision, and the output is going to be something on speech. Um, so this, this is the problem of so, um, speech separation. So you see, I think I'll go straight to the, to the examples because we don't have much time. But um, the idea again is always like trying to have correlations between the spatial location and the, and the audio. How do you think that's fair? Aaron, let me Senator, say, let me say uh, the Senator, let me give you the last story. I will tell you, there are emotional okay. stories Aaron, on both following, sides of the decision. Tom, if you could, there be, are, if go you ahead, could calm Senator. down just a tad bit. Aaron, let me say, let me say the following. Aaron, let me say the following. Aaron, let me say the following, please. Tom, if you could be, if you can calm down just a tad. I listen, buddy. I am calm as can be. You're the only one that gets off on these tangents about me not doing my job. So probably you'll get the idea of how it's kind of related to what we saw earlier. So what about uh, the opposite? What if what if you want to generate pixels instead of speech? Uh, having as input like speech and vision. So in this work, uh, what they did is they, they encode, uh, so extract some audio features. They have uh, identity encoder, so that's an image of a face. And what they're going to do is do visual redubbing. So they are going to generate pixels that redub the face to, to, to mimic or to say what's in the audio track. Okay, and it was trained like you see as convolutional layers, fully connected, nothing very fancy, so, but still quite effective, I think. Here are some pictures of people you haven't seen before. And suppose you want them to say something. Speech to vid will do this for you. Let's see this in action. We are able to speak thanks to the speech to vid model. We will try to read some weather news. That rain will gradually sink its way slowly southward into the far north of England, northwest of Wales. Some clear skies, though, developing in Scotland. Temperatures overnight, 8 to 12 degrees Celsius. But for the bulk of England and Wales, clear skies, some patchy mist and fog. And okay. temperatures stay. So probably you have the idea. Um, there's some other more recent works uh, in which they first they crop the, the mouth. So here they were like really generating the, the whole image here, so the whole face. Over in this case, they crop the mouth. But still, they do something similar. Uh. Everybody should brush his teeth after meals. Everything's all right. Don't use up all the paper when you write your letter. That's right. People ought to see a doctor once a year. Yeah. Then there are other works. I will skip because I want to show, show the, the last one. So there are like, maybe you've seen this one, um, was called popular at some point. In this one, they, they don't really generate the final pixels, but they are going to do this to animate uh, leak key points. So they, they assume some knowledge on, on what they are uh, animating. So in this case, it are lips. So they, what they are doing is like predicting the shape of some synthetic lips. Uh, they are predicting with the recurrent network, and then they do some uh, graphics post-processing, okay? So it's not, so in the previous ones, like the output was really like, the neural network was ge really generating the, the final output. In this, in this one, they are generating the animation of the lips. Given this audio as input. It's been less than a week since the deadliest mass shooting in American history. Our method produces the following output. It's been less than a week since the deadliest mass shooting in American history. And foremost in all of our minds has been the loss and the grief felt by the people of Orlando. Here's the ground truth video of Obama saying the same words. Especially our friends who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. I visited with the families of many of the victims on Thursday. And one thing I told them is that they're not alone. The American people, and people all over the world are standing with them. Okay. So uh, there's this other work where they do kind of, instead of animating the lips, they animate uh, 3D meshes. Three. It's a bit where more impressive. Probably the most important thing we need to do is to bring the country together. Uh, and one of the skills that I bring to bear 
，你们真讨厌，吃饱了喝足了就坐那儿看我说话。Somewhere Okay, so you get an idea, and that was it uh, for the lecture. So basically, the idea is that uh, by doing self-supervised learning, uh, maybe one of some of the last techniques there a bit they introduce some some more knowledge, but uh, there are many things that can be learned, and probably there it's it's quite an exciting field, and I encourage you to explore it. If you want to explore it, um, and you're still looking for a master thesis, we have a project here that's called Speech to Science. The idea is to go from speech to sign language. Um, so that's a work, yeah. So the idea will be, there are like different, we, we want to tackle two problems. One of them is to generate video um, from sign language. There are, there are already like some works that manage to generate video um, with you neural know, networks, especially starting from skeletons, that quality is kind of reasonable. So we would like to explore on this. And also um, what the main issue we have with Going from speech to sign language is that we don't have like a uh, large amount of parallel corpus. It means like a large data set of videos with the uh, exact annotation for, for the transcription for that videos. So we want to explore like, there are some techniques for text that they are trying to do uh, language translation without this parallel corpus. So we just have like many sentences in, let's say Catalan, many sentences in Spanish. Uh, I want to do translation, but w with, with nobody notating like this is this, right? And there are techniques that obtain some interesting results. That, that would be a, another approach. Uh, so if you're interested on these slides, just let me know. And I think that's it. We are out of time. But if you have a question, 